evening, everyone, and good evening to our audience that's viewing this. Uh, I'm Andy Dawkins, and I want to uh, start out by saying that uh, uh, it, it's uh, take two. I'm not usually nervous, but maybe that'll make everyone less nervous, too. All right. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and to our viewing audience as well, and welcome to our candidates tonight for the Ward 1 City Council Forum discussion that we're going to have so that all of you out there watching can get a better idea who you might want to vote for come Election Day on November 7. Uh, we've got uh, to thank SPNN, the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, for filming this tonight and uh, putting it on TV. It'll be on multiple times to view, so there's going to be a lot of times for people to see what the answers are tonight. I'm uh, Andy Dawkins. I'm former state representative for 15 years in St. Paul in the uh, Ward 1 neighborhoods. I represented Frogtown and Rondo at the, at the state capitol. And then I ran unsuccessfully for mayor in 1993. Hi, uh, my name is Abu Naeem. I'm the former Ward 1 St. Paul City Council candidate. And currently, I'm a board member of the Hamlin Midway Coalition. So I'd like to also explain what S. St. Paul Strong is. And uh, St. Paul Strong is a nonpartisan nonpartisan group that uh, believes in transparency and accountability in city government. And we're, uh, we don't pick uh, candidates. Uh, we don't make choices that way. We just like to do uh, an interview that should be uh, totally unbiased in favor of anyone. Uh, there'll be no opening statements tonight, but we'll end up, uh, after alternating the answers with the questions, we'll end up with a one-minute close. And when we get down to the last five minutes, I'll get a signal and we'll say, OK. And, uh, I think that maybe we'll start the uh, closes in the opposite direction. So Mr. Lowe, you might be expected to go first when we get to a close. All right, so uh, I want to compliment all of you on your thoughtful responses to our questionnaire. And I want to let the viewers know that they can go look at the questionnaire answers uh, by going to stpaulstrong.com. It's spelled out stpaulstrong, one word, dot com. And I want to let the uh, candidates know that you can supplement your answers after tomorrow night. If you want to go back and look at your questionnaire answers that you gave to us and amend them or add to them, you're totally welcome to do that if you'd like to do that. Uh, I want the viewers to know, though, that they can go and look at those uh, responses that you did to our questionnaire. I want to also say that we have three candidates who are not here tonight. And um, we have uh, no Anika Bowie, we have no Travis Hellcamp, and we have no Lucky Rosenblum. All three of them are running as well. And you know, it's a shame they didn't want to come here and be transparent and, uh, and give their answers as well. So good luck to the five of you as you go forward, OK? First question, and this is for Mr. Jeff Zeitler. Uh, you've just knocked on my door. You've got 20 seconds to tell me why I should vote for you. Well, that's quite a good question. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, uh, St. Paul Strong, for uh, hosting this forum. Uh, vote for me because I'll tell you the truth. I'll be straight up with you. I'll be honest with you. Um, I'm a moderate candidate. I'm neither a Democrat nor a Republican, and I don't wish to be. Uh, I'm fiscally on the conservative side. Ms. Yan Chen, 20 seconds. Um, I, when I show you the fly, I will be accountable for the agenda. I want to make it happen, because uh, it took me a while to, sort of, to, to think through what agenda I want to put on. But once I put it on my agenda, I will be accountable. Mr. Omar Sayed. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, yes, I don't knock your door because, believe me, I am the only candidate who has a city government experience. And I'm a city planning commission. I represent you as a planning commission, and I will represent to you as a city council. Thank you. Ms. Sue Worley. You should vote for me because I have worked for several candidates that are very progressive, like Philippe Cunningham and Susan Allen. I have several high-profile endorsements by uh, urban planning experts like Bill Lindicky, and I want to work for a Streets for All platform that allows for greater disability or greater accessibility for people with disabilities and also um, improved cycling access. Mr. James Lowe. All right. Thank you, Mr. Duncans. Uh, you should vote for me because I believe I'm the best candidate living here 30 years in Fraud Town uh, and what one neighborhood here. Uh, I'm an educator, I'm a father, I'm a small business owner, I'm really involved in the community. Uh, and again, my goal is to make sure that we make St. Paul better by focusing on core services and make sure focusing on your voice and your voice should be heard at City Hall. All right, second question, um, and this one will start with Ms. Yan Chen. You're out visiting relatives in rural Minnesota. Your uncle asks you, 
Why do you like living in St. Paul? St. Paul is a very diverse city. I feel comfortable. And I did not know why I feel comfortable until I started to do door knocking in St. Paul, in the Ward 1. I think I realized uh, it is uh, a very diverse and it's integrated diversity, right? Because you can have a diversity and segregated diversity. But because we integrated, I mean, clearly the immigrant is not completely integrated yet because of their language barrier. But I think after a couple of generations, they all start to spreading out and become mingled together. And I think this is really unique um, strength of our world and make our world much more tolerant and open-minded. And uh, so I think uh, that's uh, unique. Uh, that's something beautiful about us in Paul. Thank you. Mr. Omar Sayed. Well, well, thank you. And uh, uh, what was the question again? Uh, the question was, you're out visiting your uncle in rural Minnesota. And he asked you, why do you like living in St. Paul? Well, thank you. Um, I came here to St. Paul as a refugee uh, 25 years ago. That um, I went to St. Paul in, in, in public school, and uh, I am a father and husband here in St. Paul. And, and also, I'm, uh, uh, I, I own uh, two small businesses in St. Paul. And uh, I love St. Paul because the, the city that welcomes me as a refugee person uh, here in, in, in here in St. Paul and Ward 1. And as a small business owner, and I, you know, I love to uh, uh, serve my community in Ward 1 and St. Paul. And also I serve uh, a city planning commission on St. Paul. And also I'm a vice chair of a, uh, a, a, a city uh, St. Paul. And yes, yes uh, my, my vision is that uh, St. Paul is that to build affordable housing. That's what I am here and, and temple to serve. Ms. Sue Worley, so what are you going to tell your uncle? Well, I would tell my uncle that I love St. Paul for the same reason that I bought my Victorian house, which is that it has irresistible charm. Uh, the food is really good, and it may be a little rough around the edges, but with some uh, dedicated investment and time, it can live up to its full potential. Thank you. Uh, Mr. James Lowe. Yeah, Uncle, I, I love living in St. Paul for a lot of reasons. First of all, the people here. We have amazing people. Our diversity here from all walks of life. We have an international of people here in Ward 1. Our diversity is our strength. The food here, we have amazing food. For example, Mark Hill Bakery from, from France, Paris. They right here in Frogtown and, and, and actually now in um, some in the neighborhood right now. Our great school, our affordable housing, our parks and rec are all the great reason why I love living in St. Paul. Thank you. Mr. Jeff Zeitler. Well, I've actually had this actual conversation with real relatives, and uh, I love I love St. Paul. I didn't ever intend to move here, but I ended up here, and I, I absolutely love this place. It's a community. It's a real community uh, with people from all different walks of life, all different types of people. Uh, my wife and I have very different backgrounds, and we both, we both love it here. Our kids are going to public school, and we're glad to be in a city that has uh, a large city that has good public schools. So all these things have helped to keep us in St. Paul. Thank you. Abu, do you have a question for Mr. Saeed, Omar Saeed? Yes. Uh, what is the least favorite favorite thing living in St. Paul? Well, yes, um, I love St. Paul because the, the first city that uh, allowed me to open a small business, that St. Paul. Yeah, le yeah, least favorite thing. So, yeah. Least yeah. favorite. Oh, the least favorites. Oh. Well, um, well, in, in when I drove on, on the winter time uh, on the summertime, I see the potholes. <laughs> Ms. Worley, same question. Potholes is definitely one. Um, it's very difficult to bike here. I don't own a car, and every time I try to bike anywhere, I take my life in my hands, and I think we could be doing a lot better on that. Mr. Lowe. One of my least favorite things is uh, just, just the safety, public safety piece. We have a lot of room to improve here. You know, talking to a resident about catalytic converter being stolen, you know, cars broken into, just being fearful, right? You know, just to have that in the back of your mind, like, St. Paul could be better if we can work on public safety piece. So, um, again, if we work on that, that's my least favorite part. Other than that, it, we are an amazing city. Mr. Jeff Seidler. Oh, the streets were impassable this winter. The, they were barely plowed, at least in our area, they were barely plowed. And then the potholes in the spring uh, were kind of a shock. Uh, but the, I'd say the, my least favorite part, uh, unfortunately, is the recent rise in crime. Uh, we had a catalytic converter stolen. We've had our garage broken into. Uh, I've had my car gone through multiple times in the last year. And I'd say that's, that, that doesn't make me happy. Ms. Yan Chen. 
Um, I guess I will echo with him, but I also will say a little bit about the cleanliness. I let a lot of the leaders uh, all over the city of Paul and uh, as if we don't care as a city, and that's making me sad. Ms. Worley, you go first on this one. Uh, I want you to tell me and Abu and the audience uh, something that makes us know you in your gut get it about racism. Wow. Well, uh, I would not say that I could ever get racism the way a person who wasn't white would get racism. Um, I am a Jewish person, so I do understand uh, what it feels like to be a minority, and I work to be anti-racist. It is an ongoing, never-ending process. Uh, but yeah, I don't think I could, I mean, I, I do my best, but I don't think I, I get racism per se. Mr. James Lowe. Racism is something that is, is real. It's happening in our community. Um, as a Hmong American male, um, something that I witnessed throughout the year is just my personal struggle of being picked on when I was younger in school, being bullied, and, and just, just the, the marginalization of just the oppressed from the system. So to me, as an educator, this is something that is close and personal. I work hard every single day to make sure we combat racism and make sure that we have a better understanding in our community. Mr. Jeff Zeitler. Well, as a white guy, I haven't had to deal with racism, racism directly myself, uh, I'll be honest. Uh, my wife is an immigrant and a woman of color, and we're raising mixed-race kids. Uh, so seeing the reaction, the different reactions that people have to me and to her when we're out together uh, has, has taught me a lot. Uh, our kids are growing up in a, in a very different world uh, than I grew up in, but I think they're doing well in it. Um, it's, I think it's good to see. St. Paul has been good to them. Thank you. Ms. Yan Chen. Could you repeat the question again? Yeah, I want to hear something from you that tells the audience that you get it in your gut about racism. I think uh, the sad truth is when people, before they even able to open their mouths, already has a stereotype upon them. And it's sad as a human being. I think one of the things is, uh, um, how can you feel good about yourself if you feel immediately already inferior to somebody else without uh, even able to speak a word or say anything. So I think, yes, I feel sad. Mr. Omar Sayed. Well, um, I grew up in St. Paul and I went to high school in St. Paul and I seen that um, our, where our children and even myself, I you know, I had a, a poly and I have a, a racism. And, but, um, since I grew up, I've seen that a little bit getting better in St. Paul. And yes, and it's still there, but we need to do much better then. And thank you. Mr. Uh, Naeem, you got the next question. We start with Mr. Lowe's answer. Yeah, so to mirror Andy's question, tell me something that, that you get, that you really understand what inequity and poverty is. Manov, Mr. Lowe's turn to go first. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Naeem. Yeah, and equity and, and poverty is something that my family, we, we went through and in a way we're going through. I think growing up as um, right here in St. Paul, um, you know, being first immigrant here in St. Paul to go through when my mom was making $12,000 a year and have to provide for all eight siblings when my father was on social security. Um, so the, the poverty piece is, is near and dear to my heart. That's why I worked twice as hard. I was the first one to get to college, get my master's degree, and to become an educator um, to, to combat the equity piece. So there's a lot of work to do, but as long as you work hard in this society, you will make it, and you gotta just keep working hard and, and believe in yourself, and uh, just keep going strong. Mr. Zeitler. Well, I, I own a business now. I've done, I'd, I'd like to say I've done pretty well for myself. Uh, growing up though, uh, I was the kid who got reduced lunch for a while, free lunch in school. And where I grew up, you had to walk up to the front of the classroom every, every Monday and pay your lunch money or announce that you had free lunch or reduced lunch. And I was one of two kids who got reduced lunch. For a while, I was the only kid who got free lunch. And that was an education in being humble, I think, that I've never, I've tried not to forget. Yeah. Ms. Jen? I guess uh, the first time I realized uh, I'm vulnerable was uh, when I just came to America as a foreign student. And uh, life in China at that time was a purely communist society. So uh, it was resource poor, but we never needed to worry about the financial stability. I think when you start to realize, oh my God, my life uh, depends on my 
um, income and uh, how can I support myself? That was an eye-opening experience. And uh, yes, I think uh, it makes an impact on you and make you start to realize the vulnerability of a human being. Mr. Sayed. Well, um, this question really touched me because um, my mom and dad, where we grew up, and we still have in Somalia, we grew up a small village and with no water and no uh, electricity. And uh, yes, and uh, I, uh, we grew up and with no, even sometimes we, we eat uh, once a day and with no food. But I am here and with uh, uh, my family, my uh, son, I mean, you know, my wife and dad, my wife and son. And it's, you know, I, I still support my family and I'm, uh, I'm happy to see that I'm, I'm here to support, support my family. Ms. Suze Worley. Well, the way that I have come to understand um, inequity and racism is through uh, reading, mostly. Uh, reading articles by people of color, reading books, some of them fiction, some of them nonfiction. Uh, and, you know, watching documentaries. Uh, I think that, you know, you can never, as I said before, you can never fully learn, but uh, I do try to listen to other people, like obviously the George Floyd uh, murder was horrifying and you know I saw people who were trying to protest just to get you know more police accountability getting maced that's been something that was horrifying and um, I believe in trying to make things more equitable including like I would say um, what's the word I'm looking for reparations um, I support you know any program that helps to write historical wrongs, basically. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Mr. Zeiler, we're gonna go uh, start with you on this question. What was the last volunteer activity you engaged in? Oh, man. Well, I helped out in my kid's school. I brought a, uh, I made a uh, potatoes, cheesy potatoes uh, for the exchange students showing up at my kid's school. Ms. Yan Chen. <laughs> I guess I'm a too quiet person to volunteer things. So that's, I have to say, it's my weakness. Uh, um, I have, I, I, I cannot remember, to be honest with you. Okay, Mr. Syed. Yeah, I do, uh, um, I do uh, volunteers and uh, through the, my businesses and uh, um, each month that we do community service and that we give them back to the community. Thank you, Ms. Worley. Uh, the last volunteer activity I did was on Saturday. Um, there's a, I'm in a magical singing group called the Elizabethan Singers. We dress in full Elizabethan or Tudor garb, and we sing at the Renaissance Festival. But on Saturday, I sang at the Pine Tree Orchard, and the people who were waiting in line to buy apples got to hear us sing. So that was really fun. Uh, okay, Mr. Lowe. All right. Um, I've dedicated my life to you volunteering. It's kind of part of my blood and who I am. Um, anytime I could, I, I'm, all, I'm out there volunteering and giving back to the community. Uh, one is, uh, example is last week, Wednesday, I was helping my students stay after school to volunteer with social study homework. So that's one example. Another one here is last weekend um, at Agape Mount Garden, where we uh, give experience. We invite the community to come out, check out the Mount Garden in Hugo, Minnesota here, where it has Mount House and Mount Artifacts and stuff like that, and uh, to really celebrate the Mount Peace uh, by giving an opportunity for the community to come check it out. So thank you. Abu, you have a question to start with uh, Ms. Chen? Yes. Uh who has been a role model for you? Henry Warris, actually. Who? Henry Warris. Tell us about him. So he is the vice president uh, for the for the um, the vice president for FDR. He, I think, he didn't get in the second term, but he was the first uh, vice president. Uh, I mean, he was the vice president. Uh, I think since nineteen, I don't know the the second turn of FDR. And uh, to me, he is amazing because uh, he is a scientist. And uh, I think because there is certain personality, similarity, he is quiet. Uh, and, uh, but he is not a politician, but he did uh, really revolutionize American agriculture, bit, bit, the, the whole agriculture, put the more science into agriculture um, sector. And uh, also, I think it played a bigger role in the uh, Great uh, um, Depression time to provide the, make sure the agriculture um, 
provide the food for the people and able to regulate the business, so start to regulate the, the uh, agricultural business. So to me, he was, uh, uh, you hardly hear from him. I think he is the, actually the first one started the progressive party. Mr. Henry Wallace? Henry Wallace. Very good. Yes. All right, Mr. Say. Well, Well, um, I have I have a two people that in my mind that that who uh, if if you know that who always I think about or I talk to them if, if I um, you know uh, question or one of them that my friend that who works in the, um, uh, the banks and when I first try to open a small business and he he the one who says you know. And you can do this business in because of uh, um, you, you know, your knowledge. And uh, the first business, the second business, I spoke to one of uh, other friend and, and and my wife, and and they said yes, you can do the other in the second business, and because you did the first one first. Thanks, yeah. Ms. Worley. Um, well, I have a lot of role models, but I would say one that stands out would be um, Senator Erin Murphy. Uh, she's unapologetic unapologetically uh, progressive. She works to help other uh, elected officials in swing districts get elected. She isn't afraid to go out and knock doors for candidates who share her um, beliefs and, and she's working to make the state a better place. Thank you. Mr. Lowe. Yeah, for me, I have a lot of role model, but most importantly, I want to highlight both uh, my parents. My father, Nadia Lowe, and my mom, Chow Yang. My mom recently passed away about 10 months back. And uh, I dedicated my campaign to my mom and my, f my parents and all the parents out there because parents are the ones who give not only birth to us, but teach us, my, my parents teach me a good value, how to be a good person, how to give back, help the community, you know, the push of getting a good quality education and, and have a full-time job that is something that you're passionate about. So I'm able to be here today because of my parents. And uh, again, gratitude to all the parents who have kids. So thank you to my parents and all the parents out there. Mr. Zeitler. Well, the... The first vote I ever cast when I was 18 uh, was for Paul Wellstone. And Paul Wellstone, although I'm, I call myself a centrist and a moderate now, Paul Wellstone I always admired because uh, he took a stand and he had guts. He never backed down. He was, the, I believe, the lone voice to vote against the war in Iraq when uh, nobody else was supporting him. Uh, so I would say I would like to at least in some ways, following follow Paul Wellstone's footsteps and you know, not back down and, and stand for what I feel is right when I feel it needs to be done. Thank you. All right, next question. Uh, we'll start with uh, Ms. Chen, I believe. It's your, no, we did, you, your turn to start first, right? Okay, good. Um, how are you advantaging ranked choice voting as a strategy in this election? Well, me again. Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's Omar. Oh, I'm, thanks, I'm, Mr. Syed, your turn. <laughs> is rank choice is, is tough, even I don't really know on how it works. And because in, if somebody from rank choice and listening to us or watching us, I, I, do, I, you know, I, have, I do have a question then, you know, we need to teach that, our okay. community. We'll get back to that. Uh, Ms. Worley, how are you advantaging rank choice voting? Well, I, I do support rank choice voting. I think it's great. It uh, gets rid of the spoiler effect, which is huge. Um, I I'm doing it two different ways. The first way is uh, by keeping a clean, uh, you know, positive, issues-based candidacy, kind of like the politics of joy that Aaron Murphy does. And uh, the second way is when someone says they're voting for someone else and it will not be moved, I say, that's fine. Go ahead and vote for me as your second choice. And so far, everyone has said, okay, I will. So it's been really useful. Uh, Mr. Lowe? Yeah, I do too. I support right choice voting. And how I'm taking advantage of this is uh, simply what Ms. Sue uh, Woolley talked about is, you know, we're talking to you at the door, we're phone banking. Hey, you know, can I call on you to be my first choice? And when they say, I'm sorry, you can't. Then I say, you know what? We are a right choice uh, city here. Can I count on you in my second vote? And most of them say yes. So uh, that's how I'm leveraging um, the ranked choice. And if not, I say, can I, can I be your third choice? So mm -hmm. not, you know, can I be your fourth choice, right? So that's how I'm taking advantage of the ranked choice voting. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Yeah. Mr. Taylor. Well, similar to uh, both of your answers, I, you know, I, I try to talk to everyone. And if I see someone else assigned in a yard, I don't walk away. I talk to them and say, hey, I'd love to be your second choice or your third or, you know, I, hopefully not your eighth. Uh, but please, uh, please put me on the ballot if you agree with even a little bit of, of what I'm saying. Ms. Chen. 
I will echo with everybody, except I want to point out one thing. I also trying to talk to the Republican. For whatever reason, seem it's the Republican quite often really hate ranking choice, which I don't understand why, because uh, they seem feel our some poor politics become the way it is because the ranking choice, which I don't agree with. I think it was because, I hate to say, they don't have a strong candidate. So don't blame on the ranking choice for the failure of some poor politics. Yeah, that's good. So for the audience that's watching this, ranked choice voting, we have eight candidates running in Ward 1, right? Is it likely that one of them is going to get 50% plus one of all the votes on the first count through? Very unlikely. So then the last place finisher who is in eighth gets dropped off, and all the voters who voted for that eighth, that last place finisher look at the ballot again and say, who was their second choice? And so if one of you is a front runner and you got 49%, but you didn't get to the 50% plus one, um, you're in the lead, but you haven't got there yet. So if we're going to go to the last place finisher. And then if you get over 50%, the election's over. But if not, we're going to go to the second to last place finisher, drop that person off, and look to who everybody voted for. So it's very important for you candidates to be out there saying, yeah, you know, I'd love your vote as the first choice. But, you know, and you got a favorite already. But here's why I'd like to earn your vote to be the second choice. So that's the good way to think about doing it. All right, who's up the next question? Is it your turn, Abu? Uh, yes, yeah, so it be Sue Worley. So... Uh, is your neighborhood safe, and what makes a safe neighborhood? That's a great question. Um, I should, before I begin, I should mention that I've uh, felt safe pretty much everywhere I've been uh, in the Twin Cities. I don't own a car. I know I keep saying that. Uh, I bike, walk, and bus everywhere, and I have virtually never felt unsafe, maybe once or twice in um, two decades. So. Uh, it's not really about whether I feel safe, it's about whether other pe people feel safe uh, to me. And I have noticed that there are people who are increasingly not, feel not feeling safe. But I would say that what makes a safe neighborhood is people trusting each other, being able to like keep watch out for each other. Um, and also just, um, you know, having a lot of foot traffic uh, makes it safer because there's more, more eyes on the sidewalk, you know. And then just in safety, and safer um, accessibility when you're trying to cross the street so you're not going to get hit by a car, uh, better separated protected bike lanes so that you're not being hit by a car. I'm actually much more concerned about being hit by a car than I am about being mugged. I know maybe that isn't everybody, but that's my primary safety concern. Mr. Lowe. You know, this is, it, it depends, right? Uh, yes and no, but for me, I'm going to A on the side. Do you feel safe? So sometimes no. You know, uh, my family, we grew up in uh, Frogtown for the last 30 years here, and um, Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, you, you just have to watch your back. We have incidences. We have things taken from our cars. And, and you know, the fear is always there sometimes. So I want to be honest with the audience. So if you're feeling that, I can relate. I have kids. And sometimes I don't allow my kids to sometimes walk across the street without my supervision as a parent. So we have work to do in making sure that our community is safer. Um, and, again, um, that's the thing about what one is we have different community that we feel differently depending on where you live in your zip code. So most importantly, as a next city council member, I'm going to work and make sure that we continue to make sure, uh, St. Paul here and what one here safer. Thank you. Yeah, very good, Ms. Sadler. Well, I'd say this, the, you know, there's, there's two different ways of looking at safety. There's personal safety and there's, you know, property safety. There's personal crime and property crime. I'd say as far as personal safety, our neighborhood is mostly safe. Now, does that mean it's safe for everyone? No. Does it mean it's safe for young kids? Like when my kids were young, did I want them running down, you know, being out of sight of the house? Not necessarily. Do I feel threatened, you know, walking down the street? No. Um, but, you know, the city should be safe for everyone. That's, that's the key thing. You know, just because I don't feel threatened doesn't mean the city is safe for everyone. The second thing is property crime. Some people like to say, oh, that doesn't matter. They're just things. Well, if my bike is stolen and I need it to get to work, or my car is stolen and I need, it to, need, need that car to get to work, that matters. That's, that's a real quality of life issue. And I think we've seen a much bigger slip in property crime and safety of your, your stuff in your garage uh, over the last three, four years. Ms. Chen. I would agree um, with uh, what Jeff said. And uh, I think uh, it's uh, the nuisance crime. And uh, that sort of destroyed the social fabric. 
and it's like uh, when I go, when I work in, uh, in the yard, I don't want to leave my tools, especially power tools, uh, in the yard because uh, when I turn around, so it's uh, this kind of insidious fear. Um, not really necessarily worry about the violent crime because it's really watch out your back. Uh, the least kind of opportunities uh, um, crime can be really hurt you. I mean, change your cycle. So that's uh, how I feel. Uh, Mr. Said. Yeah. Um, well, I um, grew up in Summit Hill in area. Um, when I moved on, it was it was you know the safer the the safety wasn't um, good up there, and it's still not good. But and as a father, and I when I'm taking my kids in the morning to cross the street, I usually look at it and you know how you know, how we can cross the road. And uh, yes, and uh, we need a, uh, to do much better to, for safety in, in, in St. Paul. And I will work with our um, neighbors and, 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 uh, and also the community uh, leaders and to make better uh, safe in St. Paul. Okay, Ms. Welling. Ms. Welling. Could, I, uh, could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, uh, Abu? Yeah, is your neighborhood safe? Wait, did you answer? I answered already, yeah. Oh, geez, no, thanks no. for being better at <laughs> hey, moderating this. The answer is doing. yes, my neighborhood is safe. Oh, yeah, all right, great, sorry. All right, now this next one I am going to ask, and I think that the first person this time is going to be Mr. Lowe, if I got that right. Okay, it's a long question, and I'll read it slowly, okay? So, how will you work to reconcile the reality that people living in different parts of the city have had different lived experiences regarding public safety. How will you work for solutions that are citywide, inclusive, and reflect multiple lived experiences? Mr. Lowe. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, Mr. Dawkins, I, I, as I allude to my, my response earlier, I am a candidate where I lived here for a long time, and, and I get to see the bad, the good, and the ugly in our city here. Um, so I will definitely work with everybody here. Um, I think what I'm going to do here is, in terms of solution here, we got to uh, make sure that our um, neighbors' voices are heard. So what I will do is champion a, a, a link or a website, go into different community here, to different parks and recs, to different neighborhood, um, to, to the residents and say, hey, are you concerned? Really do a dive survey here, comprehensive survey here, to see how different parts of the community are feeling about their neighborhood. Because we know block to block, it's so different. Uh, in addition to that, I'm gonna work with local, local law enforcement here, with St. Paul Police here. They need to be a part of this picture. We gotta hold them accountable, but we also um, ask them for their support as well. So that's what I would do, is work with law enforcement, work with our fellow city council member uh, to make sure that voices are heard and that we are responsive to the different needs of different parts of the, uh, the neighborhood here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Zaylor, so uh, you're representing the whole city when you're on the city council. and. There's folks that live on Highland Parkway and there's folks that live on Payne Avenue on the east side. And the folks in Highland Parkway have one idea about what makes the, what we gotta do to, to have a citywide safety way of doing things and the folks that are kind of in the heart of uh, uh, a tough neighborhood might feel differently. How are you gonna reconcile those and work on a citywide solution? Well, there's, you know, safety, there's, 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 two, there's two components really. Like there's neighbors watching out for each other. You know, that's, that's one component of safety and there's the police you know, kind of the outside force coming in. That's another component. Um, unfortunately, you know, it seems often the poorest neighborhoods are the hardest hit by crime. Uh, and I think defunding the police uh, has been a failure. It has been a failure. The whole notion of defunding the police has, has really uh, caused higher, higher crime in the city. And I think it's a difficult thing to say, but I, unfortunately it's true. Um, how do you reconcile this? Well, I think Highland Park gets police calls. The police come faster to Highland Park. Uh, do they come fast to Payne Phelan? No. Uh, the police need to show up quicker to every address, uh, particularly addresses they haven't been showing up to. That's, they're, they're getting paid to do this. Uh, and I don't think they can make many excuses. Uh, they need to show up every time, every place. Um, that's all I got to say. Ms. Chen. Um, from door knocking, 
my experience has been there's two types of crime. One is hot, what I call hot spots. Hot spots usually happen in the disadvantaged neighborhood. So my pr the goal is really remove the hot spot in the disadvantaged neighborhood. But there is another crime, type of crime, which is random crime. That actually happens everywhere. And uh, for random crime, I think for us, so we really first need to establish what it mean by crime. Because uh, one of the things uh, um, is roiding a crime. Personally, I would say no. But on the other hand, when you're loitering while stealing, that uh, considered is a crime. So I think we first have to identify what it mean by crime. And once we identify it, uh, I think we just have to catch the people and uh, put them into a um, a county has to prosecute them, and my hope is really the state to reform them. That's a very important step. And uh, whether through job training, whether through uh, counseling, whether through life skill management, uh, people need getting reformed. And in my opinion, that's a state job, and uh, we need to hold the state accountable for them um, to reform people uh, once they commit a crime. Mr. Said. Well, um, as a same, we, you know, as a city council, and I will work with our, um, and, you know, my colleague of city council to make sure that uh, citywide has a, um, a, a, um, a safety. And uh, yes, some area might be uh, um, less crime, and you know, other ones might be more crime. Especially in Ward One, we have two parts, and in in one side of and Frogtown might have more crimes. But we need to make sure that we have to have more police there. We need to hire more police there, and also we have to be accountable to the police. And the other one that uh, we need to have uh, uh, community leaders and faith leaders are working with the city councils to make sure that um, we are, our neighbors are safe. That's what, that, that's that's my 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 vision will be. Ms. Willie. Thank you. So. I do my best to be pithy, but I'm going to be honest, there isn't enough time allocated to answer the level of complexity in your question, but I will do my best. Um, I'd like to address catalytic converter converters, since that has been the thing that has been brought up by um, my colleagues here. Uh, there was a Republican legislator, whose name escapes me at the state level, who uh, ha who's operating a chop shop, and he voted against funding for uh, for the state to crack down on catalytic converter thefts by tracing them up to the to the chop shops, to basically to the people who were in charge. A lot of organized crime is top down, and then there's people who are on the street just sort of stealing, and then but they sell to people who are breaking the law and buying catalytic converters when they should not be. So the clear answer was that legislator ended up not getting reelected, and they ended up funding uh, a program to you know to stop the catalytic converter thefts, and hopefully that will help. But that's the kind of thing we need to be doing, is working with the state, finding out where this crime is coming from. A lot of it is not necessarily even in the city. It's like out of the state or out of the, the county. Uh, not always, of course. There is always petty crime and gang violence. Uh, for gang violence, I would definitely address it by um, using a violence interrupter-like program. Uh, it's in Chicago. It's kind of like a witness protection program for Instead of like the FBI doing witness protection for big mob bosses in New York, this would be a, a smaller program done through the city, which would offer, um, it would prevent reciprocal violence from gang violence. It offers people an assumed identity, takes them out of the neighborhood, offers them housing, a job, just basically offers them a chance to not shoot the person back. And it's a, a, a similar program in Chicago led to a 40% reduction in violent crime in the first year. So I would support something like that. I believe in restorative justice practices where possible. Um, I, I think that uh, we should be looking at other ways to uh, prevent crime rather than just shooting people or putting them in prison. So I'm gonna say right now that um, uh, we'll have everyone give a chance again in this, but Ms. Worley, the Chicago program does what, and what are we going to do at the city level in St. Paul to imitate it? What do you want to do when you get elected, if you do? What's uh, the Chicago program you're talking about? Yeah, it's like a witness protection program. Okay. So, like, let's say someone tries to shoot somebody else and misses. Instead of that person who just almost got shot trying to shoot that person back, they could go to a city office and say, I need to lay low for a while. Someone's trying to kill me. Mm -hmm. They could potentially participate in 
uh, the investigation. And uh, it's not like um, an informant program. Informant programs don't offer protection mm -hmm. to the informants, and informants have a very high fatality rate, which makes it not a good program, I think, uh, mm -hmm. because you don't want people to be killed for cooperating with an investigation. So uh, the Violence Interrupter Program uh, was actually organized for by Philippe Cunningham when he lived in Chicago, and then he worked to implement it in Minneapolis as the um, Office of Violence Prevention. So okay. I just that, want to do something like that. That's good. Let's give everybody a chance to add more. Mr. Lowe, you want to add anything to the this questions, the answers to this question? Yeah, you know, I think what I want to add is something, you know, in terms of the, um, you know, um, that we haven't talked about is I think public safety here and to, to make sure that everyone's voices are heard. One of the things is we have to start them young. You know, um, I think as an educator, you know, one of the piece is, you know, safety starts from the school setting. It starts when they were younger, elementary to middle school and high school, and then when they become an adult. So we have to, um, in a way, shape our young minds here about making good choices. So I will be, uh, as the next city council member, I will be interested in working with our school board here to make sure that we look at restorative practices, to make sure we look at, you know, um, you know, um, mindfulness, to look at different approaches so that our kids can start making good choices when they're young. So when they get to that adult life, 18 and over, they can continue to make good choices. Um, so again, uh, public safety, different neighborhoods have different needs, and we have to be targeted, but also have systematic uh, within our school system here and our community partnership to make sure that we bring um, the, the concern, public safety, the crime rate uh, lower or down as minimal as possible. Mr. Zeitler, anything to add? Uh, actually, when I was out flyering, I met a couple of guys on Rice Street who were, uh, they were representing their church, and they were trying to interrupt violence by handing out water and meeting people and talking to people and just being a presence in the community. And I thought, that is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great thing they're doing. Um, however, we can't rely all on volunteers and people you know, doing things you know, on a volunteer basis to stop violence. I mean, we do still have to have a traditional police department to you know, be the backbone of the system. Ms. Chen, anything to add? Um, maybe the, through the park and the recreation uh, sector, because I think when kids have nothing to do, especially in the summertime, uh, that's actually what I heard uh, during, when the, during the summertime when did the door knocking, a lot of parents complained there's not enough programs for the kids. Maybe we have enough facility, but if we don't have enough programs for the kids, uh, they can doing the wrong, uh, they will fall into the wrong hands. Uh, and I also have more talk about the volunteer. I'm pretty sure there will be a lot of people willing to volunteer to take, a, um, like a start a sports group. Uh, and but so that's really up to city council or district council to organize all these activities uh, or maybe work, work with the park and the recreation. So I think the city council has to be very active about uh, using rec park and the recreation as a uh, um, alternative uh, approach because uh, you know school board is a little bit different so but uh, since the city council do have uh, the power over park and the recreation we should be very mindful how we budget this sector and make sure kids uh, has a venue to go to mr said um well here are a couple of things i want to add um first of all when we uh, say that crime or or in sample that if you come out to our youth and uh, um um, yes, we need to have uh, um, our, our, our park and recreation center. We need to have an you know, accessible place that our kids can play uh, um, basketball or, or soccer and are can play in every summertime. And, and also, we need to have a healing center in, in, in St. Paul. In, in, in that um, whoever using our kids, if they're using our kids with drugs, that can have a healing center. Uh, I, I'm proud one of them in, in, in Frogtown. That just opened it and a couple a couple years ago. It it, it works ev it works every day, and, and 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 you know and I'm I'm so proud of that one. So yeah, we need more of that one to have in in St. Paul to make sure that our uh, uh, we're not letting out our kids to uh, even when they have uh, drugs or when they have uh, in, in 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 something that have gone outside and playing. So that will be I will be working as a city council member. We need have we will have more. Uh, um, um, so healing centers, and also we need to have more of the um, uh, soccer or, or, or basket and, and tournament in, in somewhere in, 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 in the you. world, one example. So um, I think uh, we're going to do one more question and then take a five minute break. Everybody can relax for a couple minutes. And, um, and I don't know what to tell everybody to like, you know, it's nice to see you all smiling. And I'm, 
Hoping you're enjoying this a little bit. But one last question before I break. Yeah, so this is directed to Jeff. Uh, uh, what personal actions you have taken to curb gun violence? And if elected, uh, what actions will you take? What actions have I taken to curb gun violence? Boy, that's, I didn't expect that one. Um, I have not done anything much personally to curb gun violence, uh, to be very honest with you. And uh, I would love to see it reduced, but I have not done anything yeah, on my own to do so. Um, I'd be interested to hear other responses. But what would you do if you got elected? To curb gun violence? Yeah. Well, I think it's great to see folks out in the street, like the guys on Rice Street, like just being there, watching, being good neighbors, you know, giving people bottles of water and like just being witnesses to what's going on. I think that's really valuable. You know, people being there and neighbors watching the street makes a big difference. Um, I think that is the biggest crime deterrent of anything, just good people standing there watching and, you know, often it's teenage kids, you know, they're not, if there's an older person there watching, they're probably not going to do some of the things they would do otherwise. So I think that's the most valuable thing, just neighbors getting out of their houses, not watching TV, to actually talking to the neighbors and actually seeing what's going on on the street in front of their house. I think that's Ms. the most valuable thing. Ms. Chen. I guess, the, um, yes, gun violence. Um, hopefully, we can break this cycle before getting there because, uh, I mean, given the amount of uh, gun, the availability of the guns, uh, and uh, it is uh, just a hope of, I guess we have to strengthen people in terms of their, their ability to cope with a problem. And uh, when the issue become uh, a lot of life management skill, and uh, so I guess the first thing we w needed to work was the neighborhood identify the signal when things start to happening. Is a domestic issue, is uh, um, basically, I think there must be a lot of signs first showing up. I will work with the police to understand what signs start to showing up. Once you can identify the signs, uh, and uh, let's work with the police uh, how to disperse the sign because uh, I'm pretty sure there is something coming before that. And we just need to have the community force gathering together, able to identify these signs and try, trying to disperse them before they're happening. Mr. Sayed, what have you done, if anything, to uh, personally to deal with gun violence and what would be a solution to gun violence if elected? Well, first of all, in, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the, our, our um, uh, voters in, East, in, 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 in World One called me and says, my uh, uh, son had a gun in, in last night, and then, uh, and then um, he, he brought it home. And then uh, uh, the family says, what we can do? And I went there, and I told him, hey, we spoke same language. And let's sit down this. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, not, we'll call the police. You know, we'll take, we'll take, they will take the gun. And let's slow down things. But what we need is that, my vision is that, instead of um, a, a, a solving problem with the police, for a community, community leaders can solve the issue. Community leaders can solve. Faith leaders can solve. And a counselor can go there, and families can go to counselor and, and, and can solve. So I will work with the police. I will, I will work with the family, uh, uh, community leaders. And I will work also with, uh, with the faith leaders to make sure that uh, in, instead of come, you know, having, killing each other, we, ju we just need to solve it and, and, and reduce the crimes. Ms. Worley. Well, um, in terms of reducing gun violence, the number one action I have taken is not owning a firearm. Uh, that's the number one way, uh, like, you're much more likely statistically to be killed by a firearm if you own one. So um, I discourage my friends from owning one as well, although some of them do have one. Uh, of course, it's legal to own a firearm if you have a background check and everything, and I do support people's right to have one if they really need one, but they're not likely to benefit from owning one, uh, just statistically. Um, I also support the recent ordinance that came up for a vote, and then I think it was tabled for further study, which would um, make it illegal to leave an unsecured firearm in your car. Um, I think that uh, 
as far as I understand, most of the handguns that are used in violent crime in St. Paul are stolen from cars. So basically somebody passes a background check, buys a firearm, and then leaves it unsecured in their car when they're going to the hospital or some local establishment. Someone steals, someone goes through their, their car uh, to try to steal something, finds the gun, and now a petty thief has a firearm and commits violence with it. So I do support the ordinance to make it illegal to have an unsecured gun in your car. Uh, Mr. Lowe, before I, I got a, it was tabled by the city council. They didn't vote on it. I don't believe it's been voted into law yet. Okay. Uh, that was my understanding. Maybe they did it today. I didn't read the news today, but okay. <laughs> um, as far as I understand, it was it was up for a vote, and they said, "Well, we don't understand exactly the logistics of how we're going to implement this ordinance, so uh, we're not going to vote on it today." Mr. Lowe. Yeah, to me, you know, uh, Mr. Darkin, you know, gun violence, it's a connection with domestic violence. Um, when I was a board member, I was the low council member uh, at Mo 18 Council. Um, I took the lead in organizing because when we talk, when we look at domestic violence, it's connected to gun violence in the community. So to prevent that, to cure that, we uh, what I did is organize a community uh, uh, forum where we invite uh, uh, the police chief and uh, a few police officers, um, the county, where we do awareness and talk about education and talk about prevention and have um, family members who are impacted by gun violence talk about their story. And uh, that's powerful to hear from them and to talk about prevention. What I would do as next council member is, again, I am uh, very pleased that St. Paul, we uh, do not sell bullets in the city of St. Paul. So anyone who needs to buy a bullet will have to go outside of St. Paul. So that's one way that city of St. Paul has championed and this gun violence piece. The other piece here is, you know, this is a federal issue uh, to connect to the state. So what I would do is I will uh, make sure I uh, connect with our fellow council member, organize us so that we can advocate at the county level, at the state level, and at the federal level here uh, to make sure we have better gun control and gun violence um, policy in place and legislation. Thank you. Okay, so um, to the audience, I want to uh, tell everyone that uh, uh, there are questionnaire responses that these folks have answered that you should go to stpaulstrong.com and check out, because we don't have time to ask all the questions. So you have to go do some research to find out more about what these candidates think uh, they'll do if they get elected. So um, this uh, next question, uh, I'll start with uh, uh, Abu. You ask it, and I think we start with Ms. Uh, we start with Ms. Chen. Yes. All right. Uh, we are voting on a sales tax increase on November seventh. Are you voting yes or no? And the follow-up question is: What is your understanding where the new money will be used for, and is there sufficient guardrails? I would vote for no. And uh, I think uh, I haven't even thought about the consequence because to me it's absolutely no because it's really very irresponsible for city to even trying to increase the sales tax without looking at their current budget because their current budget is uh, um, they haven't uh, but um, they have uh, neglected their infrastructure for past 10 years, and that they shouldn't expect uh, residents to start to pay more property tax uh, in order to support uh, their, um, for, the, for the infrastructure. And what's your understanding of where the money is going to be used for? Uh, infrastructure? Okay. It's, yeah, low. Mr. So. Syed. Well, uh, sales tax is, I'm, I'm fully supported, and I am, uh, as you know, I'm a small business owner, and it is difficult to uh, to my, you know my customers, but um, our road needed. Our road, we need to rebuild our roads, and and uh, yes, I support it. Okay, uh, Ms. Worley. I personally will vote for the one percent sales tax. My understanding is that it's going to go into the general fund to help pay for uh, the things we haven't been able to afford, like plowing, road repair. Um, I do not think there are sufficient guardrails on the funding. I think that um, if elected, I would like to implement something called a pilot program like they have in Boston, which um, requests voluntary contributions from nonprofit, non-tax paying entities like hospitals, universities, and religious institutions. And that money would go into a dedicated, um, untouchable fund uh, that would be for essential services like water, sewer, road repair, and plowing. Uh, and and it couldn't be used by anything else. Uh, it would be the dedicated pot of money. Mr. Lowe. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Ducky. Now, personally, I will vote no on the 1% sales tax increase on November 7th here. Um, and the reason is, you know, simply listening to the voters. You know, being at the doors, you know, phone banking, voters, residents are saying, you know, James, that's going to impact all of us, especially with my fixed income or no matter what income, you know, higher income to, you know, a most vulnerable income owner, um, they're going to feel the pinch of this 1% sales tax, especially when the state just increased a 1% sales tax statewide. So that's going to make another 1% increase with us. That's going to be, St. Paul's going to be the highest sales tax uh, probably in the state of Minnesota. And that's not okay. That's not competitive. Uh, in addition to voters, the other piece is business owners. We have small business owner here who are struggling to be competitive. We have downtown St. Paul struggling. To, we have a lot of vacancy spaces in downtown St. Paul with commercial retail spaces. This is going to hurt business owner and, and especially small businesses here in St. Paul. Uh, and the other piece is this, and talking to experts, we're going to have opposite effects. So instead of, you know, uh, St. Paul residents shopping here, they're going to be intentional and shop with our neighbors in Roseville, Woodbury, go somewhere else where the sales tax would be lower, especially with bigger purchases, right? For example, I was talking to a neighbor and it's like, James, if I'm going to buy a banana or buy stuff to fix my house, I'm going to pay a few thousand, a few hundred. Instead of shopping here in St. Paul, Midway, I'm going to go elsewhere to shop for that. So it's going to have opposite effect. I don't think we're going to get that $1 billion that we, we projected to get. Um, so, again, it's going to have the opposite effect. Um, and I really uh, am thinking this is not the way to approach. Uh, we need to be more creative. We need to look at big projects at the county state level. I can expand on that later. But, yeah, uh, I'm going to vote no on the 1% sales tax Mr. for the Zeller. people here. I would also vote no. Uh, my understanding is that, yes, it's supposed to go to infrastructure, uh, patching our roads, plowing our roads. Um, but as an example of something it might go to uh, is the Summit Avenue reconstruction plan, which is supposedly adding bike lanes, but it's a street that already has bike lanes. Uh, and the residents around there are mostly against it. Uh, it would, they would lose trees. Uh, you would add nothing of real value spend $6.5 million of this 1% uh, additional tax and make the residents angry. That is not a recipe for success. Do I think there are sufficient guardrails? No, I think it would be absorbed by the general fund and you know we'd probably be looking at another uh, sales tax increase within a few years. So absolutely not. Uh, businesses are closing all over the city right now. This is not just in theory, it's actually happening. Down the street from me, the place the, the bar and grill just closed. The TJ Maxx, my wife likes shopping at, just closed. Uh, places are closing all over the city, and it's serious. This is not, you know, just fooling around. Uh, One percent sales tax, uh, the increase in property tax, and this is really bad for St. Paul. And if, if you're going to shop, uh, you're going to have to go to Roseville for most stuff soon, and that's not good for St. Paul. It's great for Roseville, but not good for St. Paul. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're going to get ready to do the one minute closes, but there's one more question first before we do that. But you can start thinking about how you want to do your close. Uh, but this is, uh, uh, I'm going to lump two questions together. And so uh, respond to how you see fit. Do you support tax increment financing? What is it? What's its impact on St. Paul? And how can St. Paul increase its tax base or protect its existing tax base? Understand enough, Mr. Syed? Your turn. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, um... To me, is I don't support other tax uh, increasing in St. Paul, and we need. But well, they, we already have tax increment financing. Yeah. Do you support it? Um, well, are we talking about TIF? TIF. Okay. Um, well, if uh, I, I don't support it, TIF, no. Okay, Ms. Worley. Um, I support tax increment financing. I've seen really great projects uh, come out of it. The problem with it is that if a project does not uh, create tax revenue, then that shortfall comes out of the general fund. So we have to be very careful and have good judgment about what projects we choose for TIF. Um, for example, my understanding is the Kegan case market has not produced the uh, tax revenue that it was projected to, to produce. So that was unfortunate. Although I do like, I do like the Kegan case market. I've gone there a few times. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can use it for housing. Uh, theoretically, we could use it for to help small businesses. Uh, I do support it in principle, but you'd really have to be careful uh, and judicious about how you implement it. Mr. Lowe? Yeah, you know, um, TIF is, to me, I think of TIF as a double blaze sword, 
right? It's a tool, it's how we use it. Uh, personally, you know, um, we have to be very careful, you know, uh, in terms of a principle is there, but it's just being practical. You know, I'm a person where St. Paul is not rich, and we gotta be careful. We gotta be cautious with our spending, especially with TIF here, with developer or developing uh, project here, to make sure that we have our, our good rate of return. A lot of time, I'm a believer right now where we are spending way too much TIF dollar, and we're not getting the return back to St. Paul, especially with such a low tax base that we are right now. So again, we have to be careful, we have to protect it, and we have to have a system, a better system here, to allocate TIF dollars. And that's a, as a city council member, I will lead that, and I will definitely be very involved with this process. Okay, now, uh, uh, Mr. Zeidler, Think, too, about how do we increase our tax base and protect our existing tax base, as well as do you like TIF? Is that a new question? No, I okay. asked it already. But well, do I like TIF? It's a tool that can be used, uh, but I think more often it's abused. Um, I think a good example in Ward 1 is the Allianz Field. Uh, when that was rolled out, when the, the plans were rolled out in 2015, I think, the drawings showed hotels and office towers and residential apartments, and it was going to be great. It's going to be amazing, all the stuff around Allianz Field, and they, we just needed this TIF district to do it. And what's there now? It's a parking lot. It's a big, empty parking lot with fences around it. And I have to say that that is a, you know, the field itself, very nice, yes, but a huge disappointment. All the, the, the knock-on growth that was supposed to happen, none of it happened, not one thing. Um, and I have to say, like, this happens, I think this happens more often than not with TIF districts. Uh, the big promises made, uh, the developer, you know, uh, gets their money, you know, they, they, they're, they're tax-free for a while, and then nothing happens. So I'd say, in general, I'm against it. Ms. Chen. Same here. In general, I'm against it because for the same reason, it's, uh, I think there's very few times uh, you have to, there will be case. I wouldn't say there is no. Um, it's a, it's absolute, but I think it's really case by case basis, and uh, one has to be really well equipped to to calculate uh, the whole financial picture behind it, uh, rather than listen to the developer. We never should a begging developer come to invest in us. Rather, we should build our own infrastructure. We should increase our residence because uh, the moment we have a strong. Um, there is more people live in our place. Uh, I think we will attract the business. Uh, so we never should beg in business. Uh, we should make our place safer, make our own infrastructure, focus on our core service, uh, make our infrastructure better, and uh, 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 building our condo, because that's actually really my goal, is to have more affordable home ownership. If we can do that, uh, I hope uh, developer want to come rather than the other way around. The bagging never resulting in anything um, fruitful. Thank you. Okay, time for the one minute closes and uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, my assistant over there put his foot down when you get to one minute. So um, we're gonna start though at that end, Mr. Lowe, and work backwards towards Mr. Zeitler. Mr. Lowe. All right, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Dockin, and both you two as moderator. Um, I'm running because I, I love St. Paul. Grew up here in St. Paul. The opportunity here in St. Paul is just amazing with the diversity here. And, you know, um, I'm also a long time resident, raising my own seven kids here in St. Paul. I'm very invested here. My goal, my vision is to make St. Paul better. And um, there's a lot of things that we have to work down. Affordable housing, less crime, you know, prioritize our core services, no removal of potholes, you know, quality education, more parks and recs, you know. Um, and there's a lot of things that we have to do here in St. Paul. Historical preservation, there's a lot of things that we need to work on and prioritize. So as your next city council member, one thing that I will promise you is this, as a resident, is to listen to you, to represent your voice at City Hall, and to continue to champion to make sure that your voice is heard, because oftentimes, decisions are made behind closed door, and we go to City Council meeting, and we're not listened to. So I would definitely be that to champion that. Thank you. And Ms. Worley. Thank you. Um, well, I love St. Paul so much. Um, I love our great restaurants, our diversity. Um, I love the Victorian charm, uh, and I, I basically love it living here. It's why I'm running. Uh, as far as my candidacy, I have three primary goals. Uh, I'd like to uh, have better infrastructure for uh, cycling. Oh, we needed that 10 years ago. Uh, we're starting to get it, and I like, I like where we're going with it, but we could be doing a lot better. Um, I would like to have roads that are closed off to motorized traffic. I think that would have a 
hugely beneficial transformative effect on the city. I would love to uh, make our roads and crosswalks more handicapped accessible and other city infrastructure as well. Um, I would also like to have more clean energy using St. Paul District Energy, having a municipal energy option that is all clean energy, uh, like you know wind and solar. And then another thing I would like to do is um, have more native plantings on city property. We have a catastrophic decline in our insect population, including pollinators. So yeah, thank you. Mr. Said. Well, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for uh, uh, Symbol Strong for having us this. And uh, my name is Omar Said. I'm your candidate, City Council Ward One. Um, I uh, uh, grew up here in St. Paul, and uh, you know I came here as a refugee 25 years ago. And as a uh, refugee in St. Paul, in Ward One, and that uh, the city that welcomes me. That I have a business, small. I have a small business in here, St. Paul. And uh, I am a father, husband, and I also city planning commission. And I'm a vice chair of the zoning city of St. Paul. My vision is clear that I will be representing to you uh, as a city council is that uh, housing. And we need to have more affordable housing in here in St. Paul. And I grew up in public housing. Yes, we need to do more home, uh, home, uh, home, uh, home, home ownerships and also affordable housing. That will be my goal, to make sure that uh, a war one has uh, affordable housing. And, uh, and, and also... <laughs> Ms. Chen. I decided to run for the city council position two years ago with a single agenda, that is crime reduction. It is uh, quite amazing how much I have learned and developed, especially in the past few months. I decided the most important part of being an elected official is being accountable. I want voters to hold me accountable for reducing crime, improve city infrastructure, and safeguard our land for future development that will make an impact to the financial well-being of our current and future residents. With that, I hope I will earn your vote on November 7th. Thank you. Mr. Zagler. Thank you. Uh, I, too, love St. Paul, and I think we all love St. Paul here. Um, and that's, that's also why I'm running. I have a few things that I'm, I want to see done. Uh, first is taxes. I want to see the taxes stay where they are. Uh, property taxes, um, uh, the sales taxes, I want to keep them where they are. Uh, it's high enough. Uh, businesses are leaving. Uh, we can't have that. Uh, the next thing, uh, streets. Keep the streets uh, plowed and patched and do without raising taxes because there's a lot of pet programs or pet projects that people are working on in the city that could be done at the state level, maybe at the national level. That shouldn't be done by the city. The city's job is to maintain infrastructure and provide public safety. And the last thing I'd like to see done is uh, reasonable city planning. Um, my background is as a landscape architect and now as a business owner. I know a little bit about city planning. I've actually done some urban planning. I think uh, the number one thing that we need to focus on in St. Paul is keeping our historic infrastructure, keeping it beautiful. Thank you. Very good. Okay, so, um, you know, um, thank you for giving up your time to care about the city of St. Paul, to want to put your best feet forward to make us a better city. I really congratulate all of you on wanting to run for office. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, the election uh, is November 7. Early voting is already happening. Uh, for the folks out there watching this, um, it's uh, going to be on several times between now and Election Day, uh, and it's available on the SPNN uh, website that if you uh, don't watch it on their TV uh, when they put it on the cable, you can also see it on the website. Ward 1, by the way, folks, is on the map back there, and it basically goes from the state capitol out Summit Avenue as far as Snelling, cuts back in and then goes up on Lexington up to Front Street, which is, there it is now, uh, which is above the railroad tracks, above Minnehaha Avenue, and then curls back to 35E and back to the Capitol. And so if you live in that neighborhood, you got some great candidates to think about before Election Day, and make sure everybody goes to vote. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.